This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Swiss Family Robinson by Johann David Wyss. Chapter 52 after having traversed for some time a desert sandy plain without meeting a living creature, we arrived at a thick wood, where we lost the traces we had carefully followed. We were obliged to direct our course by chance, keeping no fixed road, but advancing as the interwoven branches permitted us. The wood was alive with the most beautiful birds of brilliant and varied plumage, but in our anxious and distressed state we should have been more interested in seeing a savage than a bird. We passed at last through these verdant groves, and reached an arid plain extending to the shore. We again discovered numerous footsteps, and whilst we were observing them we saw a large canoe pass rapidly, filled with islanders, and this time I thought that, in spite of the distance, I could recognize the canoe we had built, and which they had robbed us of. Fritz wished to swim after them, and was beginning to undress himself, and I only stopped him by declaring that if he did, I must follow him, as I had decided not to be separated from him. I even proposed that we should return to Ernest, as I was of opinion that the savages should stop at the place where we had disembarked, to take away the boat they had left, and we might then, by means of the words Ernest had acquired, learn from them what had become of my wife and children. Fritz agreed to this, though he still persisted that the easiest and quickest mode of return would have been by swimming. We were endeavouring to retrace our road, when, to our great astonishment, we saw, at a few yards' distance, a man clothed in a long black robe advancing towards us, whom we immediately recognised as a European. "'Either I am greatly deceived,' said I, "'or this is a missionary.' a worthy servant of God, come into these remote regions to make him known to the wretched idolaters. We hastened to him. I was not wrong. He was one of those zealous and courageous Christians who devote their energies and their lives to the instruction and eternal salvation of men born in another hemisphere, of another color, uncivilized, but not less our brothers. I had quitted Europe with the same intention but Providence had ordered it otherwise. Yet I met with joy one of my Christian brethren, and, unable to speak from emotion, I silently embraced him. He spoke to me in English, a language I had fortunately learned myself, and taught to my children, and his words fell on my soul like the message of the angel to Abraham, commanding him to spare his son. "'You are the person I am seeking,' said he, in a mild and tender tone. "'And I thank heaven that I have met with you. "'This youth is Fritz, your eldest son, I conclude. "'But where have you left your second son, Ernest?' "'Reverend man,' cried Fritz, seizing his hands, "'you have seen my brother Jack. "'Perhaps my mother? "'You know where they are. "'Oh, are they living?' "'Yes, they are living, and well taken care of,' said the missionary come, and I will lead you to them. It was indeed necessary to lead me. I was so overcome with joy that I should have fainted, but the good missionary made me inhale some volatile salts which he had about him, and, supported by him and my son, I managed to walk. My first words were a thanksgiving to God for his mercy. Then I implored my good friend to tell me if I should indeed see my wife and children again. He assured me that an hour's walk would bring me to them. But I suddenly recollected Ernest, and refused to present myself before the beloved ones while he was still in danger. The missionary smiled, as he told me he expected this delay, and wished to know where we had left Ernest. I recounted to him our arrival in the island, and the purpose for which we had left Ernest, with our intention of returning to him as soon as we saw the canoe pass hoping to obtain some intelligence from the savages. "'But how could you have made yourselves understood?' said he. "'Are you acquainted with their language?' I told him Ernest had studied the vocabulary of the South Sea Islanders. "'Doubtless that of Tahiti, or the Friendly Islands,' said he. 
but the dialect of these islanders differs much from theirs. I have resided here more than a year, and I have studied it, so may be of use to you. Let us go. Which way did you come? Through the thick wood, replied I, where we wandered a long time, and I fear we shall have some difficulty in finding our way back. You should have taken the precaution to notch the trees as you came, said our worthy friend. Without that precaution you were in danger of being lost. But we will find my marks, which will lead us to the brook, and following its course we shall be safe. We saw no brook, remarked Fritz. There is a brook of excellent water, which you have missed in crossing the forest. If you had ascended the course of the stream, you would have reached the hut which contains your dear friends. The brook runs before it. Fritz struck his forehead with vexation. God orders all for the best, said I to the good priest. We might not have met with you. We should have been without earnest. You might have sought us all day in vain. Ah, good man, it is under your holy auspices that our family ought to meet, in order to increase our happiness. Now please to tell me. But first, interrupted Fritz, pray tell me how Jack is. He was wounded, and— Be composed, young man, said the calm man of God. The wound, which he confesses he owes to his own imprudence, will have no evil consequences. The savages had applied some healing herbs to it, but it was necessary to extract a small ball, an operation which I performed yesterday evening. Since then he suffers less, and will soon be well, when his anxiety about you is relieved. Fritz embraced the kind missionary, entreating his pardon for his rashness, and adding, Did my brother talk to you of us, sir? He did, answered his friend. But I was acquainted with you before. Your mother talked continually of her husband and children. What mingled pain and delight she felt yesterday evening when the savages brought to her dear Jack wounded. I was fortunately in the hut to comfort her, and assist her beloved boy. And dear Francis, said I, how rejoiced he would be to see his brother again. Francis, said the missionary, smiling, will be the protector of you all. He is the idol of the savages now, an idolatry permitted by Christianity. We proceeded through the wood as we conversed, and at last reached the brook. I had a thousand questions to ask, and was very anxious to know how my wife and Francis had been brought to this island, and how they met with a missionary. The five or six days we had been separated seemed to me five or six months. We walked too quickly for me to get much information. The English minister said little, and referred me to my wife and son for all details. On the subject of his own noble mission he was less reserved. "'Thank God,' said he, "'I have already succeeded in giving this people some notions of humanity. They love their black friend, as they call me, and willingly listen to my preaching, and the singing of some hymns. When your little Francis was taken, he had his reed flageolet in his pocket, and his playing and graceful manners have so captivated them that I fear they will with reluctance resign him. The king is anxious to adopt him. But do not alarm yourself, brother. I hope to arrange all happily with the divine assistance. I have gained some power over them, and I will avail myself of it. A year ago I could not have answered for the life of the prisoners. Now I believe them to be in safety. But how much is there yet to teach these simple children of nature, who listen only to her voice, and yield to every impression? Their first impulse is good, but they are so unsteady their affection may suddenly change to hatred. They are inclined to theft, violent in their anger, yet generous and affectionate. You will see an instance of this in the abode where a woman, more unfortunate than your wife, since she has lost her husband, has found an asylum. He was silent, and I did not question him farther on this subject. We were approaching the arm of the sea where we had left our pinnace, and my heart, at ease about the rest, became now anxious solely for Ernest. Sometimes the hills concealed the water from us. Fritz climbed them, anxious to discover his brother, 
At last I heard him suddenly cry out, "'Ernest! Ernest!' He was answered by shouts, or rather howls, amongst which I could not distinguish the voice of my son. Terror seized me. "'These are the islanders,' said I to the missionary, "'and these frightful cries—' "'Are cries of joy,' said he, "'which will be increased when they see you. This path will conduct us to the shore. Call Fritz, but I do not see him. He will doubtless have descended the hill, and join them. Have no fears. Recommend your sons to be prudent. The black friend will speak to his black friends, and they will hear him." We proceeded towards the shore, when at some distance I perceived my two sons on the deck of the pinnace, which was covered with the islanders, to whom they were distributing the treasures of the chest, at least those we had put apart in the bag. They had not been so imprudent as to open the chest itself, which would soon have been emptied. It remained snugly below the deck, with the powder-barrel. At every new acquisition the savages uttered cries of joy, repeating, Mona, Mona, signifying beautiful. The mirrors were at first received with the most delight, but this soon changed into terror. They evidently conceived that there was something magical about them, and flung them all into the sea. The coloured glass beads had then the preference but the distribution caused many disputes. Those who had not obtained any wished to deprive the rest of them by force. The clamour and quarrelling were increasing, when the voice of the missionary was heard, and calmed them as if by enchantment. All left the pinnace, and crowded round him. He harangued them in their own language, and pointed me out to them, naming me Metuatuan, that is, Father which they repeated in their turn. Some approached me, and rubbed their noses against mine, which, the pastor had informed me, was a mark of respect. In the meantime, Fritz had informed Ernest that his mother and brothers were found, and that the man who accompanied us was a European. Ernest received the intelligence with a calm joy. It was only by the tears in his eyes you could discover how much his heart was affected. He leaped from the pinnace and came to thank the missionary. I had my share of his gratitude, too, for coming to seek him, before I had seen the dear lost ones. We had now to think of joining them. We unanimously decided to proceed by water, in the first place, that we might bring our pinnace as near as possible to my dear Elizabeth, who was still suffering from her fall, her forced voyage, and above all from her anxiety. Besides, I confess that I felt a little fatigue, and should have reluctantly set out to cross the wood a third time. But, in addition to this, I was assured that it was the promptest mode of reaching our friends, and this alone would have decided me. The pinnace was then loosened, the sail set, and we entered with thankfulness. Dreading the agitation of my wife if she saw us suddenly, I entreated our new friend to precede us and prepare her. He consented, but as he was coming on board, he was suddenly stopped by the natives, and one of them addressed him for some time. The missionary listened till he had concluded with calmness and dignity. Then, turning to me, he said, "'You must answer for me, brother, the request which Paramaxuat makes. He wishes me, in the name of the whole, to wait a few moments for their chief, to whom they give the title of king. Barauru, as he is called, has assembled them here for a ceremony, at which all his warriors must assist. I have been anxious to attend, fearing it might be a sacrifice to their idols, which I have always strongly opposed, and wishing to seize this occasion to declare to them the one true God. Barauru is not wicked and I hope to succeed in touching his heart, enlightening his mind, and converting him to Christianity. His example would certainly be followed by the greatest part of his subjects, who are much attached to him. Your presence, and the name of God uttered by you, with a fervour and in the attitude of profound veneration and devotion, may aid this work of charity and love. Have you sufficient self-command to delay? for perhaps a few hours, the meeting with your family? 
your wife and children, not expecting you, will not suffer from suspense. If you do not agree to this, I will conduct you to them, and return, I hope in time, to fulfil my duty. I wait your decision to reply to Paramakwekte, who is already sufficiently acquainted with the truth, to desire that his king and his brethren should know it also. Such were the words of this true servant of God, but I cannot do justice to the expression of his heavenly countenance. Mr. Willis, for such was his name, was forty-five or fifty years of age, tall and thin. The labours and fatigues of his divine vocation had, more than years, left their traces on his noble figure and countenance. He stooped a little, his open and elevated forehead was slightly wrinkled, and his thin air was prematurely grey. His clear blue eyes were full of intelligence and kindness, reading your thoughts, and showing you all his own. He usually kept his arms folded over his breast, and was very calm in speaking, but when his extended hand pointed to heaven, the effect was irresistible. One might have thought he saw the very glory he spoke of. His simple words to me seemed a message from God, and it would have been impossible to resist him. It was indeed a sacrifice, but I made it without hesitation. I glanced at my sons, who had their eyes cast down, but I saw Fritz knitting his brows. "'I shall stay with you, father,' said I, "'happy if I could assist you in fulfilling your sacred duties.' "'And you, young people,' said he, "'are you of the same opinion?' Fritz came forward, and frankly said, "'Sir, it was, unfortunately, I who wounded my brother Jack. He has been generous enough to conceal this. You extracted the ball which I discharged into his shoulder. I owe his life to you, and mine is at your disposal. I can refuse you nothing, and, however impatient, I must remain with you.' "'I repeat the same,' said Ernest. "'You protected our mother and brothers, and, by God's permission, you restore them to us. We will all remain with you. You shall fix the time of our meeting, which will not, I trust, be long delayed." I signified my approbation, and the missionary gave them his hand, assuring them that their joy on meeting their friends would be greatly increased by the consciousness of this virtuous self-denial. We soon experienced this. Mr. Willis learned from Parabakuete that they were going to fetch their king in our pretty canoe when we saw it pass. The royal habitation was situated on the other side of the promontory, and we soon heard a joyful cry that they saw the canoe coming. While the savages were engaged in preparing to meet their chief, I entered the pinnace, and, descending beneath the deck, I took from the chest what I judged most fitting to present to His Majesty. I chose an axe, a saw, a pretty small ornamented sabre, which could not do much harm, a packet of nails, and one of glass beads. I had scarcely put aside these articles when my sons rushed to me in great excitement. "'Oh, father!' cried they at once. "'Look! Look! Summon all your fortitude! See! There is Francis himself in the canoe! Oh, how curiously he is dressed!' I looked and saw at some distance our canoe ascending the strait. It was decorated with green branches, which the savages, who formed the king's guard, held in their hand. Others were rowing vigorously, and the chief, wearing a red and yellow handkerchief, which had belonged to my wife, as a turban, was seated at the stern, and a pretty, little, blooming, flaxen-haired boy was placed on his right shoulder. With what delight did I recognize my child! He was naked above the waist, and wore a little tunic of woven leaves which reached to his knees, a necklace and bracelets of shells, and a variety of coloured feathers mingled with his bright curls. One of these fell over his face, and doubtless prevented him from seeing us. The chief seemed much engaged with him, and continually took some ornament from his own dress to decorate him. "'It is my child!' said I, in great terror, to Mr. Willis. My dearest and youngest! They have taken him from his mother! What must be her grief! 
He is her Benjamin, the child of her love. Why have they taken him? Why have they adorned him in this manner? Why have they brought him here? Have no fear, said the missionary. They will do him no harm. I promise you they shall restore him, and you shall take him back to his mother. Place yourselves at my side, with these branches in your hands. He took some from Parabap Akuate, who held a bundle of them, and gave us each one. Each of the savages took one also. They were from a tree which had slender, elegant leaves, and rich scarlet flowers, species of mimosa. The Indians call it the tree of peace. They carry a branch of it when they have no hostile intentions. In all their assemblies, when war is proclaimed, they make a fire of these branches, and if all are consumed, it is considered an omen of victory. While Mr. Willis was explaining this to us, the canoe approached. Two savages took Francis on their shoulders, two others took the king in the same way, and advanced gravely towards us. What difficulty I had to restrain myself from snatching my child from his bearers and embracing him! My sons were equally agitated. Fritz was darting forward, but the missionary restrained him. Francis, somewhat alarmed at his position, had his eyes cast down and had not yet seen us. When the king was within twenty yards of us, they stopped, and all the savages prostrated themselves before him. We alone remained standing. Then Francis saw us, and uttered a piercing cry, calling out, Papa! Dear brothers! He struggled to quit the shoulders of his bearers, but they held him too firmly. It was impossible to restrain ourselves longer. We all cried out, and mingled our tears and lamentations. I said to the good missionary, a little too harshly, perhaps, Ah, if you were a father! I am, said he, the father of all this flock, and your children are mine. I am answerable for all. Command your sons to be silent, request the child to be composed, and leave the rest to me. I immediately took advantage of the permission to speak. Dear Francis, said I, holding out my arms, we are come to seek you and your mother. After all our dangers we shall soon meet again, to part no more. But be composed, my child, and do not risk the happiness of that moment by any impatience. Trust in God, and in this good friend that He has given us, and who has restored to me the treasures without which I could not live. We then waved our hands to him, and he remained still, but wept quietly, murmuring our names. Papa, Fritz, Ernest, tell me about Mama," said he, at last, in an inquiring tone. She does not know we are so near her, said I. How did you leave her? Very much grieved, said he, that they brought me away, but they have not done me any harm. They are so kind, and we shall soon all go back to her. Oh, what joy for her and our friends! One word about Jack, said Fritz. How does his wound go on? Oh, pretty well, answered he. He has no pain now, and Sophia nurses him and amuses him. How little Matilda would weep when the savages carried me off! If you knew, Papa, how kind and good she is! I had no time to ask who Sophia and Matilda were. They had allowed me to speak to my son to tranquilize him, but the king now commanded silence, and, still elevated on the shoulders of his people, began to harangue the assembly. He was a middle-aged man, with striking features. His thick lips, his hair tinged with red paint, his dark brown face, which as well as his body was tattooed with white, gave him a formidable aspect, yet his countenance was not unpleasant, and announced no ferocity. In general these savages have enormous mouths, with long white teeth. They wear a tunic of reeds or leaves from the waist to the knees. My wife's handkerchief, which I had recognized at first, was gracefully twisted round the head of the king. His hair was fastened up high and ornamented with feathers, but it nearly removed them all to deck my boy. He placed him at his side, and frequently pointed him out during his speech. I was on thorns! As soon as he had concluded, 
the savages shouted, clapped their hands, and surrounded my child, dancing and presenting him fruit, flowers, and shells, crying out, Uraki! a cry in which the king, who was now standing, joined also. "'What does the word Uraki mean?' said I to the missionary. "'It is the new name of your son,' answered he, "'or rather of the son of Barauru, who has just adopted him.' "'Never!' cried I, darting forward. "'Boys, let us rescue your brother from these barbarians!' We all three rushed towards Francis, who, weeping, extended his arms to us. The savages attempted to repulse us, but at that moment the missionary pronounced some words in a loud voice. They immediately prostrated themselves on their faces, and we had no difficulty in securing the child. We brought him to our protector, who still remained in the same attitude in which he had spoken, with his eyes and his right hand raised towards heaven. He made a sign for the savages to rise, and afterwards spoke for some time to them. What would I have given to have understood him? But I formed some idea from the effect of his words. He frequently pointed to us, pronouncing the word Iacute, Ruiacute, and particularly addressed the king, who listened motionless to him. At the conclusion of his speech, Barauru approached, and attempted to take hold of Francis, who threw himself into my arms, where I firmly held him. "'Let him go now,' said Mr. Willis, "'and fear nothing.' I released the child. The king lifted him up, pressed his own nose to his, then, placing him on the ground, took away the feathers and necklace with which he had decked him, and replaced him in my arms, rubbing my nose also, and repeating several words. In my first emotion I threw myself on my knees, and was imitated by my two sons. "'It is well!' cried the missionary, again raising his eyes and hands. "'Thus should you offer thanks to heaven. The king, convinced it is the will of God, restores your child, and wishes to become your friend. He is worthy to be so, for he adores and fears your God.' May he soon learn to know and believe all the truths of Christianity. Let us pray together that the time may come when, on these shores, where paternal love has triumphed, I may see a temple rise to the Father of all, the God of peace and love. He kneeled down, and the king and all his people followed his example. Without understanding the words of his prayer, I joined in the spirit of it with all my heart and soul. I then presented my offerings to the king, increasing them considerably. I would willingly have given all my treasures in exchange for him he had restored to me. My sons also gave something to each of the savages, who incessantly cried, Tayo! Tayo! I begged Mr. Willis to tell the king I gave him my canoe, and hoped he would use it to visit us in our island, to which we were returning. He appeared pleased and wished to accompany us in our pinnace, which he seemed greatly to admire. Some of his people followed him on board to row. The rest placed themselves in the canoes. We soon entered the sea again, and, doubling the second point, we came to an arm of the sea much wider, and deep enough for our pinnace, and which conducted us to the object of our dearest hopes. End of chapter.